if you, if you insult the honour of God, then the punishment has to be worthy of the crime. If we can't even insult the name of God, what more to the rest of his dignity? And if God offers you a gift and you slap it aside and say, I don't want your mercy, then you deserve a punishment for that insult. So how would you reply to that? Two I, I, I would reply that A, you're totally misrepresented by position, B, you've always stated and restated yourself by the same no offence, gratitude again and again. This is all taking it right. I'm trying to get to the root of it. Now, I have a lot of sympathy with your position. The root of the thing is Jesus. Okay. Your argument is free. Your argument is predicated on the fact that the literal truth is in that book. One thing is very interesting to me. The Muslims will argue the same thing. And Christians don't interpret the Bible correctly. Ah, but, 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 but I said I would interrupt you from now on because you've been interrupting me continuously. The camera will show the amount of airtime we've had relative to each other and then you can judge. And it will also okay. show how many times you interrupt. Okay, but I'm interrupting on the Bible. Would you like to do this time? Why can't we just have a conversation? Shall, shall we do this time? time might be Let's do this time. Okay, can we get a time? Time I just like time, time, time. 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 Conversation I agree, yes. but he is interrupted continuously. You're my witness. Has he not been interrupted? Has, Thank you very much. So you can't complain if you're interrupted. So now let's do it time. Good. Good. I'm just, let's do it time. Okay, we're going to do Who's opening? Who's opening? Who's timing it? How long? How long do you want? I don't know. Three minutes. Three minutes each. Three minutes. So okay. three minutes for you. Three minutes. Didn't prepare for the time debate. I'm trying to have a constructive debate with Muslims. I've done Ali Dawa on this point. I've done Kay. I've done Katu, Sam Katu. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So I'm hello. Sorry, I'm in the middle, literally. Cool, cool, cool. I'm trying to get a, okay, I'm trying to get a constructive debate on the topic of hell for the minute. My interest is in morality. Um, I have empathy and sympathy with numerous religions, including Christianity. Yeah. Most atheists think that I'm a Christian, some kind of spiritualist. Most spiritualists think yeah. I'm an atheist. I'm walking a fine line. The key question I've asked is, all of them, why would a merciful, just God create hell? If he is, or she, or whatever, is omnipotent and omniscient um, and omnipresent, we can see the future and knows exactly what they're doing, why in advance would they choose to create fallible human beings who they know are going to make mistakes, and then go, that's the rules of the game I'm going to pick anyway, and then those people get punished infinitely for making finite mistakes, even though they were constructed to be fallible. Yeah? Now it seems inconsistent. Bob said that I'm not coming from any consistent point of view. I've already said on tape very clearly, I'm judging reality based on self-consistency. If something is consistent within its own discipline, and it's consistent with other disciplines such as science, it gains more and more credibility. And I see a moral inconsistency within the text of Christianity and Islam, which I don't think totally damns either of those religions, they both have some merit, but there seems to be a moral inconsistency with a loving, just, merciful God creating hell. At the centre of the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, I see a God essentially of compassion and love who thinks we are all equal and should be treated equally, and places human decisions at the moral centre of each life. So when Bob says, who are you to choose this? I'm doing what God necessitates I do. I'm making a moral choice myself about how to view the world. And I'm hoping I do the best, yeah? And I've been created fallible and I may get it wrong. I'm hoping to get it right. But I'm looking for as much common ground as possible. And what I have liked from what I heard Bob say in the previous debate, sorry, how long have I got? What I have liked, which I think is pivotal to this discussion, is uh, something called the Euthyphro Dilemma, which is in Plato, it's in the Platonic Dialogues. And Bob said earlier that nature itself points to the good. Yeah? Um, I believe he did say that. Can I check in on that? Yeah? I would concur with that. Yeah? And this is always discussed in the youth Euthyphro Dilemma, where Plato's question address was, does God order it because it's good, or is it good because God orders it? Yeah? This is really important. You believe one of two things. I believe it's... No, I believe um, God orders it because it's good. In other words, there are laws of nature in place and God is trying to guide us to walk them the best way, yeah? If you believe that, a whole load of ideas will naturally follow. If you believe the opposite, that it's good because God commands it, which is a more fundamentalist position, then you're going to end up believing, well, if God decides it's good to, okay, to murder, that's okay, and you'll just be slavish. So it's a rock and a hard place which one you accept, but you've got to accept the one or the other. And I'm hoping we combine and agree that it's good, God, God says it because it's good. Time. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> JC. My time's
Thank you. Okay. So, go. So, my my first objection, my very first objection, is to the incoherence of the questioner's worldview. Because if you start with a premise that for a worldview to be believable, it has to be coherent, it's incumbent upon you to have a coherent worldview. To claim that you're a Christian, but not actually follow the Jesus of the New Testament, means simply that your worldview is incoherent. Now, we have the brother on camera, he's not going to deny it. He doesn't believe what the Bible teaches, he doesn't believe what the Bible says about Jesus, and he doesn't believe about the Council of Nicaea. Which means that, by every definition, he's not a Christian. So my first objection is that the person saying Christianity, the Bible has an incoherent worldview, is himself guilty of having an incoherent worldview. My second reply is that Jesus is clear. Hell exists. Eternal punishment exists. Christ said in Matthew 25 verse 46, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, does he believe in Jesus or not? Does he believe Jesus' teachings or not? If he says that he believes in Jesus and his teachings, then he should believe what Jesus says. If he doesn't believe in Jesus' teachings, then he should stop calling himself a Christian, because that is the very definition of what he Now, why is eternal punishment coherent? Because punishment must fit the crime. And the crime that sends people to hell is that they reject the mercy of God. God has offered mercy freely to you, to me, to you, Dawood. He's not asked anything in return. All you do is you accept it. It's already in your back pocket. It's in your back pocket, Dawood. Jesus did it, it's in, you've got the check, but you haven't cashed it. Christians have cashed the check of that forgiveness. And this act of mercy is out of the honor of God, the mercy of God, the love of God. He's given it freely. God has said that his honor is irreproachable and of infinite value. So much so that one of the Ten Commandments says that you should not insult the name of God. It breaks one of the Ten Commandments. Well, if you insult the honor of God, you've committed a crime of infinite value. So the punishment must match the crime and also be eternal. That is coherent. Who made it from a laboratory? Done? Let's get yeah. by yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd say on that then, if God believes, thank you, yeah. if, if Bob's honest reaction is he thinks that hell is a proportional response to that offense, we've just got a different moral compass. Yeah? Yeah? I think my moral compass is closer to the spirit of what's in his book. He thinks that it's not. You'll have to decide as a viewer which way we should go with this, yeah? Um, one thing I will say is that Bob has had the good sense in the past, I've seen him debating, to admit that he doesn't take everything in the Bible literally. Yeah? He, he has, he'll see some of it as metaphorical and he'll interpret from different angles. For example, he believes in evolution, there are certain Christians who don't. I mentioned Kay before, she doesn't, but I consider them both Christians. But on what I consider to be a pivotal point, they disagree, namely evolution. Bob has argued evolution isn't pivotal. I think it fundamentally is if you look at the book of Genesis and you want to discuss seven-day creation and a whole load of things. Now again, if Bob wants to shake his head, he can. But as a viewer, hopefully you can see that whether you believe in Darwinian evolution or not is a fundamental point because religion seems to be at odds with science. And as I said to Bob, I'm looking for self-consistency. I think the way we live in our lives day to day, we see self-consistency in each other, in the institutions we interact with. It's a good and healthy instinct you should pursue it. What I get from religion is, the truth is good, pursue the truth. My best path to truth seems to be self-consistency, yeah? Bob says I don't have a coherent worldview. No, he's right. I'm a pilgrim. No, thank you, mark that one up. I'm not. I don't say I have a coherent worldview. What I do say is, I aspire 
two for a hero worldview. My understanding of truth is a work in progress. I think the Bible is an excellent book, as arguably is the Quran and other books, to help us move towards truth. So I'm looking at a model of truth which says we're not holding the truth in our hands, the truth is over there, and religions and other books are vehicles to get us there. And each of those vehicles has they're not all equal, I'm not saying the religions are equal to preempt something I think you'll say. Each of those vehicles has certain strengths and weaknesses. I think Christianity, pound for pound, may be the best religion going, personally. But it doesn't mean I'm alienated from other religions. I think there can be value in multiple vehicles. And I don't think any of them should have the arrogance, actually, to think you hold the truth in your hand. Because we're fallible, we need some humility, and we move towards truth. So I don't believe in this literalist interpretation. And what's interesting to me is, when you debate Muslims, you're very attuned to the fact that they take their Quran textually, literally, to the last syllable. And I've seen you consistently win arguments to your credit with them because you understand the limitations of that level of literalism. What, to me, is a bit tragic is to see Christians not sit, look at the moat in their own eye, to quote, quiet, to quote, quote Christ, and understand that maybe we shouldn't take our books quite so literally as well. I don't doubt those words are written in that book, but as you're aware, I don't accept that your interpretation or even the facts of that book are automatically to be taken as read if they contradict the self-consistency morally and objectively that I'm seeking from a world view. Thank you. So this is the kind of conversation that I like, and I really appreciate your arguments. Thank you. I really do. And I like this kind of conversation because this is the kind of conversation that should be happening at Speaker's Corner, not shouting matches. Yes. yes. And I just wish Muslims would learn to have conversations in the corner, not shouting matches. So, in, in terms of what this brother said, he's, he's admitted something, and I applaud your honesty and integrity. He doesn't have a consistent worldview. Well, when you have a consistent worldview, come back and make a criticism then. Because in five years' time, you might find you're agreeing with me completely. The point of the matter is that right at this second, your own position is fluid. Your own position is changeable. Your own position is something that you yourself will admit you might not hold in 10 years' time. And so your critique of the Christian worldview can be dismissed from the point of view that it is itself inconsistent and incongruent to a, uh, a well-formed critique. Now he's reduced the Bible to the spirit of what it means. Well, the reality is that who's deciding that? Himself, based on his own opinion. That's not how Christianity works. Christianity is not a democracy. Christianity is built upon revelation. And Christ himself states, that if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with you one eye than have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to be clear. I chose that verse precisely because I don't take it literally. Jesus does not literally tell you to cut off your hands and your feet. He doesn't literally tell you to rip out your eyes. And when it talks about hell, this, this concept of hell, I have a minority view within the Christian worldview. I believe that the fires of hell are eternal. I believe that the demons, the beast and the dragon will burn eternally in hell. But I believe that the souls of sinners will be burned up in hell and cease to exist. Now, how is that reconciled to the idea of an eternal punishment of the verse that I quoted earlier? Because once you cease to exist, you can no longer benefit or profit. And the reason why you cease to exist is because you have been burnt up in hell. Your punishment is eternal. There's no coming back from it. Now, the scriptures talk about being destroyed, that God, that Christ can destroy the soul. So hell, I believe, is consistent. The soul, I do not believe, burns in hell eternally. Oh, hang on, that's important. Sorry, I didn't understand. So, if you want more time on that point, do you I'd want like to clarify? I, the, you can how, I, how long do you want to give me? I, give, give me ten seconds, twenty seconds, to clarify my question. We can go back to okay. you. 
My core objection was that infinite punishment for a finite transgression seemed not just or merciful, therefore incompatible. If you don't believe in infinite hell, I thought we think my position is So sorry, what's your position? Do you believe you suffer in hell infinitely or not? Okay, so I want to be clear. My position is a minority view amongst Christians. Most Christians do not hold my position. And the fact that they hold a different position, i.e. eternal, infinite punishment, I accept as a Christian as being not only the majority view, mm -hmm. not only the traditional view, uh -huh. but also the, 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 the view that is classical. Uh -huh. But I as a Christian have been convinced, and I am open to correction on this, that the Bible teaches that if a sinner, let's imagine you, just as a hypothetical statement, let's imagine that you, you, you reject God's grace and you go to hell a sinner. No. Yeah, yeah, uh, you beat me to it. Yeah, God, by God willing, that won't happen. But if you go to hell, I believe that hell will burn up your soul and you will cease to exist. Okay. So, so not that, that, that's, uh, what, what makes it infinite, what makes it eternal, is that the consequence of your soul not existing yeah. is eternal. So it is an eternal okay, no, that's an important distinction. But you have reached that point of non-existence because you were burnt up in hell. Right. That's my position. Thank you. Um, in response, um, can I quickly respond to that? And then I'm yeah, give me two minutes. In response to that, good. I misunderstood God's position. It's less draconian than I thought. Infinite torture is worse than simple non-existence, yeah? And I think the idea of non-existence seems a bit more cogent and a bit more in tune. Still doesn't go quite far enough, but actually it might break the back of my objection and I'd have to think about that more deeply, yeah? Okay. Okay? So, to, so, hang on, sorry. Yeah, go on. Okay. To look at the other things that you mentioned. Um, but when you were on the bandwagon for hell for a minute, I personally would be offended if my friend Daoud was standing here, who happens to be on Ali Dawa's team, who Bob has debated before and who I know to be a guy of excellent character, superbly well read, honest, humble, better guy than me, I would say. Seriously. Um, the idea that a god would condemn him to hell simply because in the pub quiz of which religion to pick he made the wrong intellectual choice. If that's the nature of God, I think I'll reject that God anyway. Alright? Be he God or not. Because that's just bad behaviour. You said that my behaviour is fluid. And I'd say that's what it is to be a builder. I, I think not knowing is part of the deal. Um, and I've seen that criticism be made of science. I've seen you talk about science before with uh, Mohammed Hajjah. And you both say, yes, science changes. And I think that's a bit disingenuous because, yes, science changes. But what science does in its methodology is improve, I would argue. It's fluid, yeah? It's fluid, and you'd say that as a criticism. But a mode of thinking which says, I'm going to be fluid and I'm going to try and move towards truth, it means you improve. And the history of science shows a methodology which has taken two steps forward and one step back, maybe, but has broadly improved by being fluid. So what's important to me, again, is not that I'm holding the truth in my hand, because I don't think I ever will. I think if there's a God, he's ultimately mystical and beyond my understanding. What's important is that I'm heading in the right direction. Morality is like a compass. Yeah? You want to head due north towards the light. So the, the, in the foundation, I suppose I'll go a bit deeper here. I have to... In the foundation of both of these religions is the idea of binary choices. It's either right or wrong, good or bad. And I think if you shift onto a spectrum which is instead more monistic, which goes, the truth is this way, north is this way. Now, how far off course are you? Just because you're heading northwest doesn't mean you're wrong. You're still doing better than if you're heading north, northwest, or, or east or something, yeah? So it's relative. You want to aspire to, like, it's like trying to draw a perfect circle. You'll never draw a perfect circle. But your aspiration to do so is what's correct. And that's the guide. And I'll never hold the absolute truth. So to condemn me for being fluid, I have to make choices. That's the moral dilemma of being a human being. I'm trying to make the best ones I can. I'm looking for self-consistency. And I do believe in a God of love and mercy and justice. So I'm hoping, hoping that maybe you've interpreted your book over the Japonianly, although I like what you guys said um, about hell. I, that feels like moving towards common ground. Okay, ready when you are. I'll say, okay, so, okay, so the, the, the point that I would want to make to you is that Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father except through me. 
Christ himself said, he asked his disciples and he said, Whom do you say that I am? And Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ said that flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So if you want, I, I'm telling you, pilgrim, but if you want to be grounded on the truth, if you want to head true north, you've got to head to Jesus. And without heading to Jesus, you're going to be off because he's your north star. He's your guiding light. He is the light of the world. He is the one who brings he um, the, 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 the bread of life down from heaven. He is that bread of life. He, those that feed on him have eternal life. That is where you've got to ground yourself. You've got to walk in Jesus' way. I'm not calling you to join a particular church. I'm calling you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to take him seriously. Now, I, you've misunderstood my view of the scientific method. I don't dismiss science with glib comments like, oh, science changes. I, I, I actually accept science whole and complete. The scientific methodology is sound, and it has demonstrated itself sound demonstrably through countless achievements. And anyone who's got a problem with that just has to ask, will they trust science the next time they need an MRA scan? Or why are they using their mobile phone? The, so I don't dismiss science. Christians don't, Christians who know the Christian worldview don't see conflict between the scientific worldview and the Christian view. Now I want to show you why I believe that Jesus doesn't teach the idea of eternal punishment. Um, let's, let me just show you if I can find it. Ah, no, where is it? Bear with me. No, right.